All right. Welcome. Um, this would be the fourth day of our week of learning. And this morning we are actually here at the what was the R.D. Smith Youth Center um, turned into the Boys and Girls Teen Center, right? The club. Yes, the club. So, and um, with me right here, I want you to see the outside of the building to see some of the changes. Um, the door looks cool. You see the sign. And um, I have with me Mr. Joseph Matchett. Um, Joseph, you want to say hello? Good morning, everyone. Um, we will take off the mask when we get inside the yes. building, so hopefully you can understand me. Good, good morning. Um, the R.D. Smith Youth Center, the sign you see here, shows that this building was erected in 1956. And so to keep that as part of the, a stable a monument in this community, we incorporated the name into the, uh, the, the usage of the facility for the teen center. So we renamed it the, the club at the R.D. Smith Youth, Youth Center. The club which is, at R.D. Smith Youth Center. Yes, which is definitely um, a service in this community dedicated to the services of teenagers. Okay, hey, awesome. All right, let's go in. Yeah, making a trip inside, and you'll see the doors look good. Very inviting. I love loving the colors. They lock us out. <laughs> knock, knock, knock. Must wear a face mask. Let's see what all they. Are we gonna check the temperature when you come in? All right. Good morning. Good hey, Nicole. This is the, yes, I'm good. You can sign the waiver so you don't come. Okay, so I don't save. All right. Okay, got it. Next. Yeah. 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 She's our slacking rugby here for the for the uh, King Center here. Um, she came back from Leesburg, Florida, to work with us. Okay. She worked with us for uh, five years. Five years. Yeah. Went to work with the club there, and then she came back here. So we're definitely excited about her. And you are the, going to be the site director, the site director, site yeah. manager, site, okay. Team director. Team director, okay. All right. We got somebody in the corner back there. What's he doing? <laughs> Is he a student? I can't tell. Um, he's been with Boys and Girls Club for roughly 18 years. He's our program director. Um, <laughs> he's been with us here for the past two and a half years. Okay. okay so I'm um, very excited about the staff that have an opportunity to have for certain children. Um, we'll the oh, yeah, that looks good. Look at all the colors. I love that. Um, so this all started, let's talk about when it actually started. When you started to open this, like when, when was this plan started? The, well, the plan started, well, what we have evolved to is um, over at our main site, we had teen space, which is dedicated space for teenagers. Ideally, our goal in terms of um, was to identify a facility so teenagers could be separate from the younger children um, for various reasons in terms of program service delivery model, hours of operation, and just the whole format of how you serve teenagers. It's totally different than how you serve kids 5 through, five through 12. Right. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for teenagers to be just that, teenagers. But um, we did surveys about teenagers in the other facility, and a lot of the feedback with the teenagers were they felt uncomfortable coming to the same facility with their younger siblings. Right. So it made them feel like um, they were going to daycare. We definitely wanted to, you know, respond in a positive manner to what their, what their request was. Yeah, so this has been a long time coming. It's been a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, and here we are, and it looks amazing. So, and I would say, um, and I would definitely like to credit our board of directors, every time there's been a conversation in regards to renovation of building a new facility, they have always had the foresight of, of identifying separate space for teenagers and to, to make sure that, you know, for one, teenagers can be identified separately and they have their own program space. Uh -huh. So that's always been, that's always been the concept. This idea came up, uh, came available about two years ago uh -huh. with the collaboration. Um, start out with conversations with myself, uh, Rich Gallagher, and at the time, Terry Peak. And our conversation has been um, youth development um, service leaders for how can we minimize the duplication of services? That's mm -hmm. where the conversation started. Right. And out of those lunch meetings um, that was intended to be once a month, they may have gone to once every two months because we were very busy. 
um, there were some identifiable partnerships that came out of those out of those meetings. And the um, the use of this facility was a result of that. Well, great. You want to take a short little tour before we maybe sit down and talk a little bit more? Yes. Um, when we go through the building, you will see a, um, Caroline will identify a lot of the wall signage. And this program here is our Keystone, uh, Keystone Ultimate Team program. And this program is solely built, built on character leadership development. It has okay. its own curriculum. And, and this is a stable for Boys and Girls Club. This program has been around since 1967 with Boys and Girls Club. And this is this has been the platform for partnerships from Taco Bell to Collar Foundation that has helped to fund conferences and scholarships for teenagers across the country. Okay. Keystone. Keystone. Yeah. So we want to get the charter for this charter for this organization. Uh -huh. the charter site through Boys and Girls Club of, of America and every site that operates to show its legitimacy will but we have this charter inside every facility. And what this charter states is that there's safety requirements and every membership requirements have been met okay. to open up this facility up under the umbrella of Boys and Girls Club. And actually, they come down and do, they can do a physical inspection for each facility. Because safety, physical safety, and emotional safety is our priority key for every individual that we serve inside our facility. Okay. Okay, okay. we can go this way here. Yeah, all the signage looks amazing. This is motivational, and it's very motivational for the kids as they interact inside the facility. Yeah, it's look good. And so these are just what cubbies. These are these are cubbies. Okay. Throughout the facility, where they're going to place them in where they come. So, and what are these? This is the classroom. Okay. Do you want to go over to the William Brown? Yeah, so yes, we can go over yeah, here. This is a huge range. This is what we call the community zone. Which is our e games room. Um, that has a uh, ping pong table, pool table, cover ball table, and an air, air hockey table. It's one of the big screen televisions. Yeah. And so um, this is a place where children can, or teenagers can actually sit down and, and, and have, you know, develop social skills. If they don't want to participate in the games, there's tables that they can sit down and talk. And they can, they want to do their homework, if they don't want to do it in the classroom, they can sit down and do their homework out here at the, at, at the table. This is a community zone. Okay. All right. And it looks so good. And to make sure we're practicing safety with cold ice. We have the water fountain. We have the water fountain. We have the water fountain. As is recommended by the CDC, children will bring the water bottles. That looks good up here, too. Very safety. I like the safety measures you're taking. Choice Club is another character leadership development for our for, uh, young people from. Uh, 11 to 13, so the 13 year olds will be involved in this group. That Torch Club is a free it's a free record club that uh, members will be a part of before they get into the Keystone Club. Okay. Of the year is our premier team program for um, boys and girls clubs. Mm -hmm. This program is my life from across the country and um, start out on a state level, go to a regional level, and then you go to the national level. The national level consists of five participants who have won their region, and they are the um, congressional guests for the congressional breakfast during the fall session. Okay. And so that's where the winner is selected for the Youth of the Year nationally. And every winner 
gets to spend two days with Denzel Washington, our national spokesman. Can I go home now, too? You have to be a teenager. <laughs> so how do you, what are the qualifications or regulations, you know, to be able to be a youth of the year? Instead of you, you have to be a member of your local club for a minimum of two years. Okay. And there's a packet that you fill out. Mm -hmm. that deals with your personal brand, that deals with social issues. You have to write um, um, essays on that. But the most important thing is the um, your three-minute speech on what the club has meant to you during your duration. And that varies broadly. And so when you're talking about these young people here, um, their experience is that the club has been a second home. Mm -hmm. um, it's been very life changing for a lot of these young people. Okay. And so it's their story as adults and club professionals. The only thing we make sure is that the legitimacy of the applications are correct because it's in their words. Make sure that they meet the qualification in terms of being part of the membership of, of a, a local club mm -hmm. for a minimum of, a, of two years. But other than that, the program is ran by the young people. And it's a stellar, stellar program. If you have an opportunity, um, go to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And log in, Boys and Girls Club of America, Youth of the Year speeches, and you can see it for yourself. Outstanding young people. These are your future leaders of the world. That's great. I like that too. All right. So, where are we headed now? All the facilities. Oh, that's what this town. This is the Boys and Part of this facility, from my understanding, um, was part of the William Brown High School. And so, in efforts to uh, preserve that heritage, we're going to put the emergency center in this facility where you can see um, the computers here, but on the wall, it's very important. Um, doing the research, the high school students, per se, have a school motto. Mm -hmm. Every class that graduated had a motto. We were able to carry some of the graduates from the school. By the class, I um, put the motto mm -hmm. of each class. You put this signage in here. And also, in the small signage, you put it to a where a lot of young people can serve. They have very little knowledge of William Bryant High School, but this kind of in life that will spark conversations about it. About and as you can see, they were the William Brown leaders. Colors were moving great. So in the background of the picture, you see the rain. So the rain is upon the school. That is the room to highlight the color of the school. Also, at either end of the level is, is the rain. I like that. It's very personal to our, com our community, and you know, I like that. Um, Okay. And I, I love that. Uh, this was the first high school to win state championship in Caldwell County. Really? It's high, it's, it's I didn't know that. It was highlighted in the school board that it ranked on the state. Okay, did not know that. Yeah. Fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> Caution, step down. Caution, step down. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's called the club zone. And it's highlighted by. You get a picture of the tiles. Yeah, we'll have to um, look at that. That is awesome. And what this highlights is uh, opportunities for kids to seek post secondary education options as well as career options. So we have um, colleges, we have um, the armed forces. Um, on this on this board, we have your technical colleges as, as well. It's kind of broaden the options of, of, of young people to choose um, what they want to do once they get out of school. But we understand the earlier that decision is made, the better chances of them are, mm -hmm. of obtaining what they want to obtain. True, that is true. I was making sure you don't you don't have um, Florida up there, uh, right? Florida yeah, is up there. Uh -uh. We, we don't have <laughs> Um, if not, if somewhere we don't have to show it, but we do have it. You have to support yeah, all, right? You know, never know what yeah. somebody want to do. Okay. We to do was, uh, we had a um, young man from this from this community from Dolan. I can't think of his name. We actually ended up going to the University of Florida football scholarship. So we definitely want to highlight the schools. A lot of schools that a lot of our high school 
yeah. school that's signed with. Okay. This looks good. Um, so I know that we've talked a little bit about this area and we've talked about um, the teen center. We haven't really talked a whole lot about the new development unit that you're adding on. And if you want to add a little bit about that. Well, I'm going to ask you, we um, started and I was going to talk about that when you asked me the effects. There you go. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, what? tell me, tell me, what were the effects of COVID-19 on Boys and Girls Club? Um, the, the, the initial effect of COVID was we had to change our service delivery model. Mm -hmm. um, we had to go from seeing kids face-to-face -to, -face to a virtual platform offering program. And also, mm -hmm. we expanded our, our meal providing services. Um, whereas our school program, we may have provided 400 meals a day to our members. That went to 4,100 meals a day. Wow. And so to be able to school close down mm -hmm. March 13th, um, we were able to ship our, ship our business model and open up um, March 18th and, and didn't lay anyone off. Thank God no one was no one became ill. Yes. And we actually um, was forced enough to hire about five people during that time to meet that demand. And, and so shifting the business model to still serve the need of the needs of children and to offer the virtual platform for programming was 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 different. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of learned as we as we went, but it was a at the end of the day, um, our family's needs were met, our children's needs were met, and as a result, the community was a lot better off. Well, I will say that uh, what you guys did during COVID and just kind of picking up and being innovative was just phenomenal. And that's what I keep telling anybody that wants to know what the nonprofit sector has done during COVID. I'm just like innovative. Like that's the, the big word that pops out to me and um, quick to respond, whether it was quick to be able to feed kids or quick to get a virtual program going to make sure that kids were still learning and not sitting at home doing who knows what. So um, kudos on that one. So. And, and out of that shift of the business model, what we did find out was um, there's um, it's easy to overlook the needs of the community. Um, it's a great community to be in, but however, um, there are some cracks. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about um, the virtual platform, we got as high as 85 children doing the after school program. Um, we launched that same program during the summer, and our highest number was like 35. Yeah. So although we were providing more meals, we realized that there was a digital divide in the community in terms of um, families having access to broadband. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That is true. And, and so um, identifying identifying that to go back to their facilities, Berlin and their facility are totally wireless. And so now that the school is providing the equipment, if we ever have to go back down that road again, we can have kids come into our facilities and access the internet. Okay. To, to do their schoolwork. Mm -hmm. So that'll be another shift in the business model to where we may not be as open as long after school, right. but we'll be there doing those critical school hours to offer assistance to those families and those young people that need that need assistance. That's if we have to shut down again. Yeah. And so there's just another um, broadening of the services, but identifying um, a different need in the community. We definitely want to be, make sure that we're able to meet, to meet those needs. Right. So, um, and, and again, so let's move on to, let's, let's sit down for a second in one of these comfy chairs. Let's that way. Let's sit right here. High, let's high <laughs> bar the high bar stools. Yeah. Let's see. There you go. Uh-oh. There you go. <laughs> I'm everywhere. Um, let's, let's sit up here so you can see more of the, the club. There we go. Um, so, if you can tell me a little bit, and I know we're going to wrap up here soon um, because you've given us some some great things to look at, some more information, and just seeing the teen center in general has been um, awesome. I mean, I love the colors. Everything looks great. Um, but tell us a little bit about you. <laughs> you like that? And tell us why you chose to be um, the director. Um, well. <laughs> the loaded, it's a loaded it's question, a loaded always. Question. <laughs> I, I would preface my comments saying that I am a club kid. I mean, I grew up in a boys and girls um, me and my family, um, our community went to the club. So a lot, oftentimes, back, back in those days, it was the boys' club. The girls' club was next door to us. Um, okay. They didn't become a unified entity until 1989, 1990, the boys' and girls' club birthed. So I grew up in the boys', in the boys club. And I'm um, actually, um, the 60-year anniversary of the organization I attended, because uh, as you get older, you tend to, um, 
focus more on things that are important. You tend to pinpoint you know, what will what assists you in getting to where you are. Mm-hmm. And I would say um, my brother is an employee for UPS, has been for the last 19 years. And my sister is a school counselor. Um, she has been for the last 10 years. And my mom was a retired registered nurse. And so we start talking about the impact the Boys and Girls Club had on our, had on our life. We realized it was the people who were those clubs. And so what helped me to become an employee of the Boys and Girls Club after my volunteering there was I, I was in school to be a school teacher. And um, I was a non-traditional student because I went into the military. I'm proud to finish the school. So when I came back, I was a non-traditional student. And my professor was on the board at the Boys and Girls Club. And so, of course, those who are teachers understand that during their student teaching observation, the last thing that you can do is employ me. Yes. <laughs> but being a non-traditional student, um, I had responsibilities. I had a home I needed to take care of. Mm-hmm. And so at the time, um, <laughs> she said there's an opening at the Boys and Girls Club and gave me a flyer of the of the of the position. And I went and met at the time with the executive director, who was the program director when I attended. And so um, the young lady who who held that job prior to he's that busy. he's busy. <laughs> prior, prior to that, we're on an area council for the state that's supposed to be in a class. Yes, he is actually taking some time out to um talk to us. You see them in the background, they're on the call for him. <laughs> he is a busy man. It was hard to get him to sit down, but we got it going. So. <laughs> so actually, um I, I did my um my portfolio at the Boys and Girls Club. Mm-hmm. And, and and so at that at that time, I decided that impact the lives of children was my passion, and I felt like I could be more impactful in the Boys and Girls Club. Um, the CEO part was something that I can't explain. <laughs> that was not a part of the original plan. However, I, I think it was the best decision I made um, in the sense of I most times um, and most times CEOs have to move far away and move back in the area to become um, CEO. I was mm-hmm. fortunate to move 42 miles northwest of where I was from. 42 so miles? Yeah, mm-hmm. 42 miles. <laughs> and originally, I'm from Valdosta, Georgia. So being able to be in my backyard um, where the, the climate and the culture is very consistent in what I grew up in, and I just thought this was the ideal community for a Boys and Girls Club. Yeah. Um, I, I would say... Um, the club opened here June 1, 2009. I got here June 1, 2010. And I can say, and I, and I have to say this, um, I work with some of the most um, wonderful board members. Um, so I, you've been in this position for 10 years? Yes. 10 years. 10 wow. years, three months. <laughs> how many weeks, days? How many weeks. hours? Tell me how many minutes. Two weeks, <laughs> three days. <laughs> Two six, minutes. Six hours, <laughs> six hours and seven minutes. There we go. I love it. <laughs> and I remember that because each minute is so profound in what we did. Right. Um, to, to, to start out the one club, now we have four. And I, and I would say every lesson learned is not in the classroom. Um, every lesson learned um, sometimes is practical application and, and on the job. And those are the best experiences. And so being fortunate to, to lead this organization in this community, I wouldn't trade the journey for nothing. Right. Um, great community, great group of young Great, com- yeah, and, very good community too. So. Community. And so it's the sky is the to grow slow. Yeah. So that's my story. I don't know if I answered it well, but. No, you did. Yeah. You did very well. I think it's every, you know, everybody knows what the Boys and Girls Club does. It's always good to see where you know where you come from, why you chose to do it, because um, being a director or CEO for a nonprofit is not easy. A lot of people think it is. And there's been a huge misconception that um, we don't do a lot, but we do a huge amount that people don't see because it's behind the scenes. There's a lot of collaboration, a lot of partnerships going on. And um, not only do you have what you have going on, but you partner and collaborate. We've talked about this in several videos, but 
a lot of the nonprofits in our sector and in our community, we work together. So one plays off of another sometimes. Um, and that that's that's what community is. Okay. And I think the strength of any organization or any community, the strength mm-hmm. of any community is understanding the power of partnership. Yeah. Um, understanding how effective collaborations could be. Because fortunately or unfortunately, um, we have limited people in the community. Mm-hmm. And they tend to serve on several boards. Oh, yeah. Same yeah. same leaders all around. <laughs> and so to, to minimize donor fatigue, if we can streamline the community resources, it's better on the community as a whole, and it's better on those individuals who we can drain. Right. And whether they be from the board perspective or the donor perspective. So the power of collaboration, I, I think, is the is the uh, is the is the key to making smaller communities successful and serving the needs of their community. Yeah, special rural communities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so I have a last question for you. Is is there anything that you need for Boys and Girls Club or the Teen Center that you can that the community can give, whether it's donations, volunteer, any anything that you feel like you guys need? Well, uh, and speaking to the community, it's, it's not unusual to say that we can always use your donations. Yes, um, of course. The <laughs> we're giving is the uncapped resource in the community. And, and I think we definitely have an opportunity there. So if you'd like to donate to the Boys and Girls Club, mm-hmm. um, you can go to www.bgcmotor.org mm-hmm. and hit the donating button. Okay. And definitely um, every donation is a charitable donation. Mm-hmm. It's a, de- it's a um, deduction of your, of your taxes because we are a 501c3 um, organization. And so we, we can definitely demonstrate every dime, every dollar, where it goes. Right. Um, the mission of Boys and Girls Club is to enable all young people, especially those who need us most, to reach their full potential as caring, productive citizens. Mm-hmm. And so that plays out in a gamut of ways. And that's broad, but it's broad to be intentional. Mm-hmm. We don't want to streamline any, anyone. And um, where you belong is where you tend to maximize your potential. Yeah. And so I also would like to say this. We're very fortunate to have a mentoring program. Um, we run it through our passport to manhood and our smart girls. And so we'll be partnering with the mentoring minority group at Pecom Medical College. Okay. And so they was at our uh, they were at our grand opening and that's um chaired by Dr. Walker. And so we definitely look forward to that opportunity and just, you know, to have a medical college in your community, in a rural community, mm-hmm. speaks volume about the the vision of this community. Right. And but to have that medical college to offer a program of mentoring to assist in mentoring says a lot more about um PCOM. So mm-hmm. we're definitely looking forward to that. All right. Well good. So um if there's are there any opportunity if I have somebody that called and asked for a volunteer opportunity, do you have volunteer opportunities? We do have volunteer opportunities and I would say um you reach out to the main site or you can reach out to the site in which you would like to volunteer. And what are all the sites? You have the Moultrie unit? We have the Moultrie unit. We have the Moultrie Housing Authority unit. We have the Berlin unit. And we have the Artist Smith Team Center. Okay, so four sites and options. Okay. And I would say, uh, because we're dealing with children, we're mandated every volunteer has to be um, fingerprinted to make sure that we put it safe people right. around, around our children. Mm-hmm. And, and we can't, and, and that's the most important thing that, that we can do is make sure we have the right people Right. Around the children who were trying to touch. And you did say there were there might be an opportunity if the if COVID doesn't change and we're continuing, you might have an opportunity for virtual volunteerism or something where they can. Yes, yes. Can. We'll, um, we open the doors here to serve kids September twenty first, and we're starting out small. We're doing mm-hmm. a one to nine ratio, mm-hmm. um, and if if that is successful, two weeks we'll open up some more. But also we have a hybrid platform that would offer virtual programming. Mm-hmm. And so to encourage our virtual, our virtual and, and involvement, we will ask that when we start going face-to-face, we will raffle participants from the virtual program. Right. And so uh, and so there are you know, some requirements. We're trying to serve those who need us most. Right. So it will be primarily for those students who are, who are in school. And so they can log in during after-school hours on virtual. Mm-hmm. And then once we open up nine more spots in you know, whatever facility that may be, the participants 
from the virtual, we will go into the um, the um, raffle. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you for letting us take time. I know that you're supposed to be on a call, <laughs> but um, thank you for taking time for to let us see kind of behind the scenes of what you have going on, the teen center, and um, just what you're doing in the community. Well, so, thank you. thank you for having us. Um, and we would this center is a community based center, right? And so we encourage uh, other nonprofits if you have the monthly meetings, definitely contact us. We want to get you inside the facility so you can see. Um, what collaborations and good collaboration looks like. Yeah. So we're open to having meetings. Of course, there's there's no charge for that. Okay. Uh, and we want to encourage um, all school clubs from from junior high to high school to definitely use this as a meeting space for your club. So advisors for your clubs, okay. definitely reach out. It's um, 890-0074. Ask for Miss Nicole Mark. She's the site director here. And she can definitely pencil you in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking your time to meet with us today. Well, thank so, so thanks for being here, Joel. No, I know you and Nicole are busy. I got a um, video of some of them, but I'm trying to intentionally get away from ones like FSU. And <laughs> I'm just kidding. My husband would kill me. He's an FSU fan. But. Yeah, we'll take the Florida Gator off for all you Georgia um, folks. Uh, there's my alma mater right up there, about off the state. Woo -woo. Blazer, Blazer. Go Blazer Nation. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> um, the the Moultrie Police Department has done a fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Club for the past, I guess, six or seven years. And so, um, due to COVID, they had the Wild Game Supper for us last year. Mm -hmm. and it was on the Georgia Florida weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so they are definitely moving from the weekend. But however, they are still planning to hold an event for the Boys and Girls Club. That's and right. I did get clarity during the Black Yeah, Outfield. I talked to, yeah. I was going to say, Freddie called me yeah. and I was like, talk to Freddie about it. So, <laughs> so we did get clarity so that this yeah. will come out soon. Okay. And they are wrapping off fishing boats and rifles. Oh, so, fantastic. Nice. Yes. So, but every contribution that uh, uh, will be able to assist and further improve the programs of Boys and Girls Club. So please look forward to that information coming out. And thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you for letting us come. Good to see you guys. All right.